Well, here we are, two o'clock. I'm hoping I'll see some people checking in. It'd be nice to know that you're there. And uh, if you are, you can let me know where you're checking in from. Uh, hi, Sasha, great to see you. Um, it's evening in Europe. It's kind of afternoon here, so it's all good. Hi, Jerry, great to see you. I'm really looking forward to this uh, today because um, uh, Bernie Fuchs is, well, one of my idols, I guess, uh, when I was going through art college. And I guess in some ways he's been an idol ever since. Uh, hoping sounds okay. Uh, I know sometimes I was doubling my voice, so I think I got it right this time. All this tech stuff to look after. Um, I think I'm definitely a, a better painter than I am a tech savvy person okay thanks Sasha that's great um so I'm just gonna launch into this um, at the beginning I just think I should introduce you to uh, Bernie Fuchs a little bit um, and I'm I don't have a, a great memory so I'm gonna read some stuff to you and you'll bear with me uh, he was a pretty extraordinary guy um, and, you know, at a young age, he was recognized for his genius, really. Um, so he was born uh, uh, in uh, Illinois in 1932. And uh, apparently he grew up in fairly humble circumstances. Uh, he had no father uh, in the scene. He obviously had a father, but um, he, I guess his dad wasn't around. So his ambition was to be a trumpet player. And just on that uh, point, uh, he really had a fascination about uh, music and jazz that sort of went through his entire life. Um, a lot of his uh, illustrations are, are centered on music as you look back and you can see a real sensitivity around this. Um, however, he lost uh, three fingers on his right hand in an industrial accident um, the summer after he graduated from high school. So I uh, turned to art as a career uh, despite having had no formal training. Um, he, wa he enrolled in Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, where he graduated in 1954. Um, his first job was illustrating car advertisements uh, for new center studios uh, located first in the Fisher building and then in, well, it doesn't matter where they were. <laughs> um, it was a large and very successful studio of Detroit in the 1950s and 60s. A couple of the other, the other illustrators were Chick Albertson and Donald uh, Silverstein. Bernie was recognized immediately for his incredible talent and pulled in major accounts for Greenwald. Within a few years of moving to Detroit, Fuchs opened the studio, the art group, which specialized in work for the city's auto companies. Um, in the late, teen, uh, in the late uh, 1950s, Fuchs moved to Westport, Connecticut, where he began doing illustrations from McCall's Red Book, The Ladies' Home Journal, Sports Illustrated, and other magazines. Uh, he was commissioned for the illustration of four U.S. postage stamps released in 1998. And the stamps featured folk musicians, Huddy Leadbelly, Leadbetter, Woody Guthrie, Sonny Terry, and Josh White. Uh, Fuchs also illustrated uh, several children's picture books. And apparently he really loved doing picture uh, kids' books. I saw an interview uh, where he talked about that. He painted portraits of several U.S. presidents, including John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan, as well as uh, athletes and celebrities such as Muhammad Ali, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Ted Koppel, and Katherine Hepburn. And he did illustrations of Carol Burnett for the title card for her show. Uh, he died in, uh, at the age age of 76 in uh, 2009. 
Um, so I'm going to say hi to everyone here. Hi, uh, I see Mark Kaufman. Nice to see you. Thanks for showing up, Angela. Angelica, sorry. Um, Berndt, nice to see you. Did I say Stefan? Nice to see you. Thanks for checking in. So um, there's a lot of stuff out there on Bernie Fuchs. He's, I, I would show you a slideshow of his work, but um, you can see so much of his stuff online. Uh, it's really worth checking out. He's, uh, he was a phenomenal illustrator and a very nice person. Um, I met him uh, when I was in art college and um, he, I went to the Ontario College of Art in Toronto and we had something called visiting lecture series and um, the head of our department uh, had some pretty cool guys coming into the school and Bernie was one of them. He came from the US and I knew that he was coming but that was after I had booked a dentist appointment. And uh, if I'd been smarter as a kid, um, I would have canceled my, my dentist appointment and, and watched his lecture. I really regret not doing that. But it, uh, it turned out okay because um, I, I went in early to the school because I, I wanted to meet him and say, I, you know, I love your work. I'm a big fan. And uh, I saw him in the hallway. I recognized him from his photos. And I told him, I'm very sorry, Mr. Fuchs. I, you know, I can't go to your lecture, but I just want to let you know that I'm a big fan. I just love your work. And um, you've influenced so many people, including me. Um, and he said, well, you know, it's too bad you can't make it to the lecture. But, you know, if you have a few minutes, I can show you my work ahead of time. And I thought, wow, seriously? I mean, this guy is a superstar. Um, and I just really couldn't believe that that he would make that offer. So he said, just find a room. And I did. I found a room and I grabbed a couple of other students and said, look, you know, Bernie's going to show his work. And I'm, I'm, we're, we can see this firsthand. I, I can't stick around. He had his paintings in a, a giant roll. They were just canvases rolled up, you know, all together. And he just rolled them out on the table and one by one, he pushed them to one side. And it was honestly breathtaking to see how beautiful these things were. Um, fairly large size, when I say that, you know, maybe uh, 30 by 40 inches roughly. Um, you know, some of them were maybe even a little bigger than that. But what stood out to me in looking at his work was just the a phenomenal um, light that seemed to emanate from them. You know, they were glowing and they were painted very flat. Uh, I had expected them to be more textured somehow, but uh, they weren't. They were very flat. Uh, done with layers of glazes, and and I think it was just incredible what he could do. Um, his compositions were all brilliant. They, they, he really knew how to pull off a, an amazing image. And if you see his work in magazines and you know relate it to the subjects, he just captured them so well. So anyhow, needless to say, I wanted to. <laughs> know how to paint like Bernie and of course I could never paint like Bernie because no one can I he, he was just one of a kind but he certainly influenced a lot of illustrators and a lot of painters um, because um, uh, guys like Bart Forbes for example and even Bob Peak, and you know like you can you'll find there's a group of uh, illustrators uh, from that era and you can see them attempting to imitate and in their way you know they came up with their own way of painting of course um, but you can you can still see the influence of bernie and he really pushed the illustration field a lot and for me i at a certain point his work changed from being illustration to being paintings because 
Um, you know, you could put one on the wall and just enjoy its beauty. He wasn't afraid to distort things. He used a camera for everything. He projected his work. Uh, he didn't make any bones about that. He wasn't ashamed of that in any way. And jokingly he said uh, uh, to me that uh, he sometimes when he's projecting his work on the canvas and he's working, you know, in the dark, because I used to use a slide projector, um, he didn't know what it was going to look like until he turned the lights on. So I found that, you know, honest and amusing, and yet the brilliance of his work was still there. So yeah, for illustrators, it was just getting the job done, and he was prolific. He's a very, very busy guy. So he just needed to get those illustrations out, and but he took the care that was necessary to make them beautiful. So today, what I'd like to do is just show you um, some of the methods that he used. And, you know, I'm going to go at it my way. Um, he was uh, working with a lot of acrylic and, and gouache and um, a lot of drawing underneath the acrylic uh, in his early days, especially during the car days, uh, when illustrators were used to put backgrounds behind uh, car advertisements. Um, what I've done, uh, I've prepared uh, a board that has leftover paint because I like working that way. Um, Bernie would put down a, a color of some kind um, to get him himself started. Uh, or he would draw first and then he would put a color over top of that in a transparent way using oil. Um, he, in his later years, he mostly, I actually, in fact, I think he only used oil, as I recall, maybe some pencil work or some charcoal work. Um, but um, he was able to manipulate it the way he wanted and it gave him the effect that he wanted. So I'm starting with a color that isn't quite exactly like what Bernie would use because it, it's leftover paint. But the technique that I'm going to show you is uh, the way that he would work in putting a, a glazer, painting over top of a color that's there already, and then removing paint and leaving the negative shapes and then going back into those negative shapes again with more color. He would do this with glazes. Um, um, I'm going to do it with a combination of uh, paint, uh, transparent paint, and I might even use some oil pastel. So I'm, I'm using the idea of working with negative and positive shapes, um, as Bernie did. Uh, and of course, it's not going to look like a Bernie Fuchs painting. But um, I'm going to give this a try and just see how it goes. And um, in the end, we all end up painting ourselves. So we can't get away from that. Um, so maybe I'll... I'll do a poor imitation of a Bernie Fuchs that might look like an Andrew Judd. So uh, I'm going to take, I'll just switch my camera here so you can see the canvas or the uh, board that I'm painting on. And of course, if anyone has any questions as I'm going along, I'm really happy to, to deal with those when I can. Uh, so this is the, the board. And again, it's just like leftover paint. And I've got a fairly heavy uh, amount of uh, Elkid or Lequeen. And if uh, I just I can show you what that looks like, this is the material that I use. It's a Windsor Newton Lequeen original. I mix a bunch of that into the paint. And then just to be sure that I've got a, a fairly smooth surface, even though this is textured paint, um, I want to be able to put paint on and take it off again. So I went over it all again with a, a layer of liquid, um, almost like a, well, a, a glaze, I suppose. So I can put paint on and take it off as much as I want to um, and still have some of these textured things underneath. I'd like you to, sh I'd like to show you the image that I'm planning to paint and if I get anything close to it, I'll be happy. I, I, I'll end up, in the end, 
painting something hopefully that works but I'm just going to bring this down I was trying to put this into another uh, screen and I had lots of complication with this today it's a long story and boring but this is the image that I've got um, which incidentally was sent to me by a childhood friend Jim Koval uh, if you're listening Jim or you see this later I really want to thank you it's uh, it's a beauty um, when I say sent to me, I saw it on Facebook and asked him if I could use this. And he's since sent me several really nice images. So really appreciate that. So I could just, I could draw this in place. Uh, you can go over this surface with charcoal if you want to. It, it accepts charcoal. Uh, but I'm going to attempt to... Uh, put down some areas of color and then pull shapes out of that um, So it's a kind of push and pull technique and uh, I'm working with probably more palette than I really need here um, I've got um, uh, Ivory black uh, Ultramarine blue cobalt blue Viridian um, alizarin crimson, and this is a rose of some kind. I uh, can't remember what it's called. Just a big tube of it that I hadn't used in a while. I've got some orange. Uh, uh, this is like a cadmium orange. Uh, cad yellow medium, yellow ochre, cad yellow light, and a Naples yellow. And this is a raw sienna here. It's a rublev paint. I probably won't use half of these but um, I've got them there just in case that's all hi Moni thanks for checking in um, it's great to see everyone here this is really nice um, and again if anyone wants to let me know where they're signing in from that's really nice because uh, it gives me an idea as to uh, who's checking in where you are and whether this is actually working for you guys so the first color that I'm going to put down um, is just going to be kind of a medium color. I'm going to take the ultramarine blue, and I'm going to bring a little bit of this rose color into it, which gives me quite a strong violet. Now, I can always knock the violet down if I bring in a complement color. Um, that's uh, or I can just go thinner with this application over top of the paint that I have here. So I'll just bring this up large so I can see. So you can see what I'm working on. Uh, here we go. All right. Hopefully that's showing for you guys. All right. Um, I see someone from Santa Fe. I see someone. From Toronto, great to see you, Michelle. John from Santa Fe, thanks. All right, so I'm just going to start applying this. Vi it's like a violet. It's probably a little bit dark, but I can thin it down. Like I said, I can. I've got some paper towel here, and I can just choose how much of this I want to put on. Because really, one of the nice things about this technique is just the transparency of it. And I do love having texture on the board already because it gives a sense of what you might see when you're looking for a forest or whatever. You know, if you had to actually sit down and work all these textures out uh, <laughs> ahead of time, or, or after the fact, rather, then that gets pretty tricky because there's a lot of information that just happens kind of randomly, which I which I love. It's what nature does. I'm seeing someone's uh, checking in from Germany and Flensburg. That's great. And uh, hi, Dorothy. Great to see you. Someone's here from Santa Fe. That's pretty cool. Wow, Santa Fe is beautiful. We were there several years ago, my wife and I. We really loved it. Canyon Road, that's what I remember. 
some great galleries there. So you can see how this violet kind of peeks through. Um, what I like is that if, if I don't like something, I can just take it away again. And this is kind of a fun technique. Anyone can do this. You, you can play with this all day long and it's, it's very forgiving. And I realized when Bernie was working, uh, he, you know, he had to have something that would work quickly and give an effect that was dramatic in a hurry, had some depth to it, uh, would dry fairly quickly. So he was working thin. Um, he may have used some fast dryer. I don't know. Actually, it's something I really don't know. Nowadays, we have Elka do it. We can work with. That helps a lot. All right. So I want to get sort of my values working, right? You know, just sort of get a feel. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of Viridian and just put a thin layer of that in underneath here. I see some cool greens that happen. I'm not using any medium yet. It doesn't mean that I won't. Um, that green's a little too intense, so I'm going to bring in that, that rose color. I should really give you the proper name for that. Um, of course, I put it somewhere I can't see it. So that happens. Hopefully, I don't need more of it. All right. So. This is um, kind of fun because, you know, as you go, it's kind of a, a an intuitive process. Just let the the texture of the board do the work for you. And um, if you don't like it, again, you can take it away. So that's what I love about this. Nice to see you, Rudy. It's great. Um, it's been a while. Haven't had a chance to catch up with you. We did a workshop with Rudy in his hometown a while back. And uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, in Regensburg. If anyone has a chance to go, check in on Rudy. Um, Angelica, yeah, I did prepare this board for today. Um, one of the reasons I took this board is because it had a lot of... Now, when you say, did I prepare this board for today, I actually didn't have this image specifically in mind. Um, but when I was looking through the boards that I do have, and I keep several around the studio, uh, this one seemed to uh, have the closest resemblance to the image I want to paint as far as color is concerned. And it works on a horizontal like this. So, um, okay. Now, right now, it looks like just a big mush of nothing. But there it is seeing someone from France. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, for those of you who just checked in, uh, Risa, thanks for showing, has just asked if I'm painting from an image. And I'm just going to show you the image that I'm working from. It's on an iPad. So it has a nice sense of light coming from behind it. And, the, you know, I could, in theory, I could probably just invent um, a scene here, but it's kind of nice to have some reference to follow. I'm going to take a little bit of that orange now. Now, because I cleaned my brush, I have to make sure I get a lot of that thinner out. I'm using a little less thinner, but I want to make sure that it's not too thin. I want to make sure that I have enough paint going that it covers well. Maybe I'll just take this a little bit lighter. And I'm not sure how well this is going to go on. We'll find out. 
it's a little strong and I need to, I'm gonna bring that rose into it again it's funny when you're painting something like this it's good to sort of have one color that finds its way through all the others uh, that way it harmonizes so that's a little better I've got just having a bit of that rosy color in there hi Matt it's great to see you all the way from Ottawa fantastic Matt and I uh, painted together in the Adirondacks on a plein air vacation or symposium or whatever you want to call it, it was really great it was nice to have a couple of fellow Canadians there um, amongst all the Americans we met a lot of really cool people it's a lot of fun and uh, Matt's painting has come a hell of a long way it's really he was just starting out and he's doing some great stuff great charcoal stuff lately. <clears throat> Okay, so on my screen, this is looking like really uh, yellow. So the complement to yellow uh, is violet. And it's kind of a yellow-orange. So I'm just going to bring a little bit of these other two colors in here and knock it back just a little bit. Yeah, Matt, it was a great time. We had a blast. It was uh, a real learning experience and couldn't believe how many great painters there were. And you can really learn when you're around other painters, just watching how they approach their work. I met John McDonald there, whose work is fabulous. He's a great uh, landscape artist. Nice guy too. Okay, so we're getting some feel of what I want here. Um, I'm going to go a little grayer. So I'm going to go to this raw umber here. You know, your grays are those colors that are kind of underrated, but they're the ones that help set off everything else. So sometimes getting all kinds of beautiful bright color when it's everywhere it's like they're all trying to get attention and I always tell my students that uh, if all your colors are full intensity it's like a classroom full of noisy kids you know they're all trying to clamor for your attention and so you need to have some quiet places in your painting uh, that accentuate the areas that are trying to get your attention. So if you have a classroom full of noisy kids, you notice the one that's really quiet after a while and vice versa. If you have a class full of quiet kids, you notice a noisy, noisy one. That's like your focal point. Now, what's really fun about this is um, you can take, I'm going to intensify the color towards the top a little more. And lighten it a touch. It's like Bob Ross moments here, sorry. It's a little weird. You can see I'm just scrubbing. I'm not putting like brush strokes into things. You know, that's that's not how this process works, really. Um, you kind of sneak up on the, the colors and you get this nice glow that happens because you're looking through semi-transparent and transparent colors. And the colors underneath, of course, are influencing the colors that go on top. All right, I'm gonna bring some of these colors down here. And you can see how the texture of the board just adds more excitement. I'm gonna throw a little more chroma in here. If 
if the textures happen to be put down the right way, if you have these, if I can quote Bob Ross, these happy accidents that seem to work. Now I want to make this painting my own, so you know I want to make it my own scene. In spite of the great reference, uh, I don't want to get sort of locked into one particular thing. So I try as much as I can to allow for mistakes, of course, and they happen all on their own, um, but. If something's working, you leave that and get on to the thing that's not working and resolve it. Now, I'm going to go to a little bit more of an opaque feel because I want to put some sky into this. And to me, it looks like maybe a cobalt blue. It's a little cooler, kind of overcast day. So we're going to have cool light. And when you put an opaque paint against the transparent paint, it kind of adds interest uh, because you have this sense of depth and texture that you can push. You know, when you're taking a photograph, everything's a flat surface. But when you're painting, uh, you have texture on your side if you work, make it work right. So I'm just going to try this with a palette knife. And again, these textures are going to pick up their own way. I'm not going to try and follow every bloody tree. Like, that just doesn't... Well, you'd be here all day. I would be. So I just want to get the impression, the feeling... And I have to be careful when I do this because I can pick a little bit of that color up that I see behind if I'm not careful. I, I still want to try and keep my color clean. Now, if Bernie Fuchs was doing this, he may have put down a cool color uh, at the top or as it comes down and then taken the shapes away. I'm going at this a little differently than he might. Kind of fun to see that because it does its own thing. I'm just okay, great. I always have to check my emails in case someone's emailing me to say, Andrew, we can't hear you, or something's not right, or what the hell are you doing? All right, I need a little more of that sky color. And I realize I didn't clamp my palette in, in place here. So I'm just going to do that so it doesn't keep moving around. A little disconcerting. All right. That's the beauty of uh, live stream. To put up with all the stuff you don't have to put up with in post-production. The post-production takes like hours and hours of time. So this is just kind of a fresher thing to do. All right. So you can see the sky is starting to take shape up here. And, you know, the focal area is going to be down in here. So what I want to do is I want to bring the eye down to here. And I can do that by bringing some of these textures in a kind of a, a pointed way towards it. So I'm just going to do this. The sky doesn't do this in the original image, but I'm going to do it because I want, I want people's eyes to come down to this area. Just trying to keep the color clean. And again, because I have color underneath there to watch, I don't pick up too much much of that. Now this is a point where I'm going to take the brush out and 
just get a little bit more of this the sky area. It's a little smoother, so it's not so broken up. And I'm putting it in probably a little thicker than Bernie might. That's okay. I'm not Bernie. So. What I really want is just that feeling of foliage up here. And looking at the negative shapes, trying to keep it uh, broken up. And make sure all your negative shapes are each on their own interesting in some way. Um, if you have like a stand of trees, it's all sort of exactly the same, then that's boredom. Nature doesn't do that. So. You can see how these textures really work for you. They do a lot of the hard work. Um, all right. So I'll just get that in there. So it's a little less heavy. I do like the way you see these transitions of colors that happen in these areas. Um, and that's the advantage of having paint down ahead of time because you, you, know, you have those nice things that happen sort of randomly and organically, if I could say it that way. Um, and it gives a little more feel of what we might see in nature. All right. Okay. Uh, in my reference, there are two buildings. And uh, one is in the back woods, and one is, of course, down in the front. It almost it looks like a sugar shack to me because of that funny little thing that sticks out of the roof. Um, so one of the things I like to work with are Q-tips, uh, or as they call them, cotton swabs. Um, they're, you can use them for more than cleaning your ears. So... They're a fabulous tool. Um, all right. So I'm going to use this just to take out a few little areas. So I want to have some lights that kind of pop through that feel like trees. And you can see how effective that is. Of course, you don't want every single tree to look the same. You want to make sure your shapes are changing. Um, and I can go back in with some opaque paint, some darker colors to, to uh, address areas that need to have that variation. These trees have these kind of shapes. And I'm going for the shapes. I'm not trying to replicate this scene. I just want to get a feeling. Baron's saying I should have more orange in here. Well, we'll maybe we will. I'll have a look. See how this goes towards the end. All right. I'm going to use the uh, Q-tip to try and take out paint where I want to put in lighter color in my drawing. And I think I'm going to take it out right about here. Now, it's funny because underneath it's fairly dark color, so that's okay. I just want to remove some of the paint in areas that I want to put in opaque light color uh, so that it doesn't intermix, doesn't blend too much with the color that's underneath or the layer that I put down. Otherwise, it just mucks up your color. And I'll even go into a little bit of thinner 
just to make sure that area is clean. And right now it doesn't look like it's doing anything, but I can see that that area is now clean. The color of the roof of the little building is um, uh, a little bit of a gray. So I'm going to use a, that raw sienna, slightly warm and cool. Oh, it's weird. It's kind of a bit of both warm and cool. It's a cool sky, so that's the color that's reflecting off the roof. Um, but I want to make sure that it's not exactly the same color as the sky. That's the point. It's on a slightly different angle, so um, it shouldn't be the same color. So I'm just going to pop this in here. I'll start with this and see if it looks right. If I don't like it, I can always change it. It's just paint. And there's a little roof up here. And I'm looking at values. I see that it's also the area that has the darkest darks. And the lightest lights. Of course, that's one way of making sure that the eye is drawn to a particular zone your focal area. I'm even going to use a tiny touch of, I have a violet down here. I'm just going to put this in, see what this looks like. When I use a palette knife this way, I don't breathe much. So, um, what you can't see is that I'm actually painting around my iPad. So I'm sort of like walking a tight wire here. Um, it's hard to find a way of sh doing these live streams um, without showing distortion uh, or having the, the painting on a funny angle. It's very disconcerting somehow. So this is my method. I have to go for a massage after this though, because I'll put myself in a weird position. All right, so I'm gonna pick up a little more of that dark here. Bring it down a little further. It's a little barn kind of thing here. The reason uh, I call this watching paint dry is because for some people who have tuned in, they've tuned in for like a minute and a half and they're gone again. But the people who are painters, hopefully, you know, there's something here that's of interest and maybe there's something you can use and you can learn. Every time I do a painting, I learn something, and every time I watch someone else do a painting, I learn something. So I think the point of this is that if you want to learn, sometimes you learn from other people's mistakes. So if I make lots of mistakes here, you'll learn from those too. So these Q-tips are great because uh, you really can control the paint. I can just clean edges. Um, the palette knife, of course, leaves a, uh, its own random rough edges. And it, sometimes you just need to clean them up. I'm going to make that roof a little bit bigger. Try and get my proportions to work here. Getting used to the palette knife 
It's taken me a long time. Um, I love it and I hate it at the same time because sometimes it does just the right thing and other times it just makes a mess of it. So the trick to painting, I think, is not being able to put everything down perfectly, but knowing how to correct what you put down badly. So that's what this is all about here. There's another little dark shed beside this little barn. It's part of the whole barn, I guess. The bottom of this barn is just a little darker, light color, but it's darker than what's above. And what I want to do now, I'm going to bring a brush in and just very gently move some of these colors around so they're a little more a little more consistency this it's funny if you could see me sort of painting it feels like i'm painting around a corner here because i'm i've got my ipad in front of me it's just hilarious who would have ever thought would be doing this I was thinking today, why would anyone watch this? You know, if you're a painter, maybe it's of some interest, but why would anyone else? And I just realized, well, it's way better than watching the news. Um, it's depressing as hell watching the news, watching the stock market melt down. That's always fun. Um, but it, even if you're not watching that, it's like, okay, we're going to get a vaccine. We're not going to get a vaccine, um, you know. Did we get enough? Did we? Is anyone going to actually give us anything? Is this just a big mess that's never going to go away? So it will. It will go away. So in all of the painting, with all the random things that happen, in these areas here, I have to be as random as I can be here. I need to be careful where the focal point is. And that's, you know, the challenge. <clears throat> Stefan, you know how to use a palette knife. It was really fun painting with Stefan in Vienna. We uh, really learned a lot from each other, bounced ideas around, and uh, sort of, you know, gave each other this good energy. And we had fun. Aside from all the fun, we became really close friends. And, you know, if you can find a friend who's an artist and a, a mentor as well, um, that's a great thing. And we've mentored each other, I think. I think it's fair to say we've learned so much so as much as we live in sort of these solitary worlds as painters um it's really great and we're you're very fortunate if you can find someone who can you can confide in and talk about art with uh we're sort of three of us you know stefan and elise and myself and uh, it's really uh, amazing to just to hang out, you know, and, and watch and, and learn. And I think that's one of the things that maybe is missing in this time uh, when we're doing things online, as convenient as this is, um, to have the companionship and to be able to look over other people's shoulders. I think, you know, to see the have that human connection is, is an important thing somehow.
So I'm fiddling a lot with this little building, but kind of need to. So just to get this working, be precise in some areas and loose in others. And I need to put a barn door in here. It'll be a slightly different color. I'm just going to drop it in here. So I don't know how much of this you can see. Oh, you can see that. All right. Just going to put a little, little white spot right here because there is one there. And there's a little light that comes off the roof of that shed on the side. And let's see if I can do that. Palette knife. Now, there's no snow on the ground here, but there's a lighter area, and I'm just going to put it in because it's interesting. I'll just run that through. One of the things I find as I look at it is I've made that barn a little too dark uh, because there's atmospheric perspective. You know, it's in the distance, um, even though... It looks like it might be in the foreground here. I need to lighten it up. So I'm just gonna do that. There we go, make a mess of the roof. It's okay. That's what Q-tips are for. Now you can see what happened there. There's a little light area that happened behind the barn, and I really like it. So this is where, it, you know, those kind of accidental things happen, and I'm going to go with that. Um, I'm going to bring that over in other areas and let that be part of the, the ground that this barn sits on. And just to carry this down a little further, this is um, more like the Bernie Fuchs kind of feel, if, if I can say that with much respect and um, for his genius, really. he No one could do it like him. But it's these shapes that you can pull out that give that sense of... of texture that it's important but it's not you know it's it's like there's something going on there but i really want your eye to go to the focal area and everything else should complement that focal area somehow so um everything should point towards where you want everyone to look i read just recently it might have been in one of John McDonald's newsletters. By the way, he has this great newsletter that you can sign up to. And um, he talks about focal areas. And everything that you do should be subjugated except the focal area. I mean, within reason. Um, you know, you want to have detail that makes sense for the overall scene, but you want to have uh, uh, interest in an area and definition in an area that you want your viewers to look at. So we tend to want to paint everything in the same focus. Just brought a little bit of tiniest bit of blue into the top of that roof and it helps do that over here also I'm going to go in with this wee little brush and if you have dark areas that are just kind of boring then you can pop in some color I'm gonna just for fun I, see if this will do anything I don't know we'll try I just want to bring a little more life into this shadow. 
Yeah, like that. Maybe up in here. This gives it a little bit of something. I don't know what, but something. Thanks, Jeff. Fun. Yeah, I'm having fun with this. And uh, Petra, yeah, the structure is is a lot of fun. It's you know when it's painted ahead of time like this, it gives you a chance to um, use that structure uh, to your advantage. I'm going to use a Q-tip to paint with. Uh, put a little bit of that building in behind. It should be a little bit darker. So I'm going to paint with a Q-tip. See what this looks like. And I'm not sure if the color underneath is lighter, so I'm going to experiment and try and take a little bit of color away. So there's a little building back there. And there's a tiny bit of light that comes down one side of it right in here and then I'm gonna to have to have some darker areas it's this play of value back and forth it's so important when you're doing these things you need to have a real sense of what is dark what is light what is what has more color what has less color constantly be thinking that and looking at your negative shapes. So I'm putting a building back there that's a little bigger than what's in the actual image. That's okay. And I'm gonna take one of my favorite brushes. It looks like this here, a bit of a dagger brush. Um, Michelle's asked what blue, this is a, um, the blue for the sky. Because um, if that's the one you're asking about, that's a cobalt blue with white. Um, I do have some ultramarine out, which I've used in some of these areas in here. So I've got this kind of violet blue happening. Now I just want to take I want to make sure I have good definition of the bottom of this building. So I'm going to just clean this area up a little here. And I'm going to use this dagger or whatever you want to call this thing. It's a neat brush that I bought in India. And uh, I really like it. It's soft and it comes to a great point. You can buy dagger brushes from other companies, but uh, this one just had a nice feel. It was really economical to, so I'm gonna bring some trees in here. You can see it's a very, very light touch. Just letting the brush do all the work. Get a few more trees in here, background. And here also. Um, one of the guys works that I really love a lot uh, is Andrew Wyeth. And um, when you look at his paintings, you realize that there's so little in his work, and yet it carries such a large message. So it's not about putting everything in. It's about making what you put in make the most sense. So it's a case of less is more possible. It's starting to come along. 
that building in the background is not very successful when I look at it now. So, you know, I'm going to do something. I'm just going to get rid of it because I can. I thought it was going to be nice, but it wasn't. So there we go. That's it. Just get rid of it. I'm talking about less is more. I have to listen to myself. Uh, Michelle's asking the, the addition to the roof. So that's uh, that was a cobalt blue with white. And as I look at that, I can clean that up just a little right there. All right. Now, I'm when I look at the original image, um, it's actually darker through here uh, in reality in the from the photo. So. I'm going to go back with uh, my brush again, the, the one I started with to scrub things in. And I'm just going to darken a few areas down a little more, bring a little more of that blue violet into there. Because I think it needs a little bit of that to hold what's going on in the hill that I see behind. So I'm just going to do this. It needs to be cooler. Always trying to be aware of color temperature. So cool colors recede, warm colors come forward, and that was just a little bit too warm. So this might be too dark. Let's just see. And it also needs to be cooler still. It needs to be obviously cool. And yet there's a violet to it as well. So I go over that and this. Let's just see if that works better. Yeah, that's OK, because it's still a little bit neutral. So it's not trying to get too much of your attention, but it's holding this area that needed to be a little bit darker, which also makes this area look lighter. That's kind of the. Oh, the magic back and forth. And Gallic has asked uh, what colors I paint with. Um, my preference is Old Holland. I really love their pigments. They're, they're dense. You get a lot of beautiful color out of them. But I don't always use Old Holland. Sometimes uh, I can't find them or they're expensive or, you know, they... Here in Canada, they're certainly very expensive. Uh, so whenever we're in Europe, I try and pick them up there. Um, so Windsor Newton's good, and Michael Harding is good paint like that. And if I'm covering a really large area, I'll if I just need texture and I want to get something going, I'll I'll even use student grade. You know, the cheaper paints are OK. It doesn't mean you can't use them. Um, but if you're getting into some details and you want to real have, really have color control, something that's going to glow, um, then I think uh, you, you want good color. Hi, Dora. Nice to see you. Okay, so this is getting to the stage where I have to be careful I don't kind of overdo areas. I want to bring a little more of the feeling of the grass that's happening up in, up in this hill area. And they're really subtle colors. So just taking a little care to, to get your colors right makes such a difference in the long run. I like that warm green that's happening there. I kind of feel like I want to pick up a little something here to show it's a hill that goes up and behind. So 
again, no uh, thinner on my brush. I just want to go straight into color. I'm going to use a Viridian. I want to cool it down a bit with a red. And I'm going to add in a little bit of white just to see what that looks like. Now, whether you can see this the way I'm mixing, probably not. There we go. It's more like that. Looks like it could use a tiny touch of warmth. And I'm just going to try it. Let's see, like so. It's too intense. So I have to bring a little more of the red. Compliment color. That's red. So let's see what this looks like. That's a little better. So I'll just go over what I did there. And color is relative always to the colors around it. So you think you got it right on your palette, but it, you don't know if it's right until you actually put it on your painting. So it's really something to keep in mind. Just because you mixed a color on your palette doesn't make it right. And it doesn't magically change when you put it on the painting. So that's already a little better. It's holding that hill a little better. I want to get rid of the lights that don't make any sense. This softens the trees down as well. So it comes out here. I can take that down a little more and just show that this is a hill that's going on in behind. Now I've sort of got this big shape that holds that shape there. My eyes coming up to the, the barn here. Um, that warm color is nice. I kind of feel like I could use a little more, but I have to be careful that I don't overdo it. I also need something that, a path that gets me into this. So when I say that, I want to have the sense that I can get into here without uh, too much effort if I want to go for a walk. And I'm going to pull some of this color out here. I can. I want to get some of that green that I see that opens it up. So why not paint it in, in an opaque way? So I'm going to try something here. Um, if you have oil pastels, you can use that in your oil paintings. I don't know if you know that. This is a really intense color, so I don't know if this is going to work. It might, might not. Let's see. It's not too bad. So you can use oil pastel. And um, in fact, you can even move uh, the oil pastel around if you are using paint thinner. And it's also picking up some of the texture that I see. I like it because you can, you can draw with it. You can get a little bit of control. Maybe I'll get a slightly darker value, maybe a little warmer value. I'm going to try it. I don't do this very often. I don't usually put uh, oil pastel into a painting like this. But this is just to show you some of the techniques that you can use. Create a little more excitement in your work. It's nice to have a variety of greens. And again, more chroma towards the focal point. So when I say chroma, more intensity of color, right? That's starting to feel okay. I think it's going to be okay. All right. I want to get a little more detail going in just a few areas. 
without going overboard. Okay. I am going to go I like this pastel, I've got like a gray pastel, it's a lighter gray. I just want to try this in here and see who can control it. Yeah, that's good. Just to bring the eye down a little more in that area. What happens is it opens it up so that, you know, once I take a walk along here, and I have a, I keep going. I can find my way back through the woods somehow. So maybe this is the illustrator in me. You know, there has to be some kind of story. I don't know why, but there it is. Um, Risa, yes, you can use pastello with acrylic. Now it is oil, so it sits on top of the acrylic. Um, I, I, the problem with the oil pastel is that it's something that can move around on the surface. And so really, you know, oil painting, you want to be able to frame it without glass, ideally. And so what I'm doing here, um, I would at the end, make sure that I have a good varnish over the whole thing. I'm just going into the pastel here and moving that around with a bit of uh, thinner and it softens it down. But you have to make sure that you varnish it properly. And if you do it with a spray varnish, uh, that can work. Um, I'm not sure what the efficacy is of it, frankly. And again, I'm thinking right now a little bit more like an illustrator than kind of a, you know, painter for a gallery. So I want to bring a little more life into this area here. a little more texture as we come into the foreground. And this is the idea that I'm talking about, having a path that gets you in. Um, so your eye is taken back through here. And, you know, you sort of say, well, what's the point of all of that? Um, it's basically just supporting the overall composition. It's all it's doing. And, you know, if I had that smack in the middle of the painting, it would kind of you know, it'd be boring, honestly. So doing this kind of thing is just the ways of making sure that you get your audience to where you want them to go. And break up the areas that are a little bit dull. That's a dull area right there. Sometimes I just like to go through a painting um, and, you know, scrape and scratch and you can see, you know, little dark bits and little light bits. It becomes peripheral. If I, if I want to, I can even scrape like lights out of these areas here with the edge of the palette knife. I'm not sure I like it. If I don't, I just get rid of it. Just like so. And then of course I stuck my finger in the paint, so I gotta smooth that out. Sometimes I find with these paintings, I end up paint with my fingers. And I like that because it gives you real control, smooth things down, soften areas. Now it's starting to have a little more atmosphere. And I like the idea of taking a little more out of here, just so I'm going to carry that path back a little more.
and should connect somehow with this here, looking at shapes. Um, now I'm wondering, as I look at this area up here and down here, um, I could bring a little bit more of a warm color, some of that kind of thing, maybe into this area. Uh, so I'm just going to try this with this really thin brush just to block in a couple of warm bits. And just see if it helps. If it doesn't, well, it's okay. Let's get rid of it. In some ways, it's almost an impressionist feeling, uh, the way the color breaks up. <clears throat> I don't mind that. So when you're looking at a painting and, you, you know, you sort of wonder, well, what shall I do? Sometimes you look at it and wonder what I should do. Sometimes the best thing to do is to walk away and come back to it when you feel fresh. And the first glance you have, very often, it lets you know, uh, says you know what this looks funny here you got to fix this um and other times it's just okay it's, you know you just leave it alone says leave me alone i'm fine i have enough to say on my own i don't need you anymore so i know not everyone's paintings talk to them mine do a lot of times they say leave me alone and i don't listen Now I sort of feel what's missing now is just a little bit more foreground somehow. I'm gonna go in with a few darks, bring in a little chroma, that rosy kind of color. And I'm just gonna quickly put in a few little things that feel like, well, you know what? We're up here in the foreground. We're not important, but we we are a foreground. We're bigger shapes here, more contrast of value. And you don't want to have the same shape everywhere. And if it's too strong near the edge of your painting, uh, then you should soften it down like this here. So there's a sense of this kind of graphic quality here, and it's a little bit more figurative or realistic here. Um, if you look at Bernie's work, you'll find that uh, he keeps that graphic quality fairly consistently throughout, especially in his later work. Um, it's really neat to see. Some of them look very realistic, they do, and others just are, they have this graphic feel, which works so well, by the way, for printing. We've come a long way with printing from those days. I'm just tying these shapes together a little bit here because I don't really see the side of that barn. The only thing missing is an owl, which I'm not going to put in. <laughs> I clean a couple of edges up here.
now I sort of feel like I've got one area that's strong, another area that's strong, the rest of it kind of supporting. And I'm very tempted to get ridiculous for a second here. And I may just ruin this, but anyhow, if I do, I do. So see what happens. I'm going to bring in a foreground texture, which will be green. And the, the color of the green is important because I don't want to have it take away from everything else that's going on around. So I want to test a little spot. And yeah, that's actually not bad. And I'm just going to do this. Now that's a little crazy. It's probably too much. So what I can do, because this is a takeaway method also, I can go back into that and I can just scrape into it in a few areas, take the paint away, let that warmth come through. And just make that a little more subtle. But what I do like is the way this kind of streams up from the bottom now. So that adds to the composition a little bit. And because I have Q-tips here, I can go into my thinner and just take out a couple of areas that are just a little too heavy. I'm happy to make anyone a friend, Risa, if um, they make a request. Especially artists, since you've asked. There are so many good artists out there and so many people who are taking this up now um, since we have more time at home. And uh, I think it's just great. Texture happens more in the foreground, and it gets softer in the background. But I really do like texture in a painting, like so that it's not all sort of flat. Um, and I like these accidental things like this. You know, it's a color that's probably more intense than it needs to be. Um, but I think it holds that area well. It takes us into this. There's almost like this triangular thing that's happening this way. And then that opens into the sky. Um, and it's enough. This here is getting a little too much attention. So I'm just going to knock that down just a little. Soften that. And that little dark spot right there, I don't know where that came from. That's where the signature will go. Some, one of my teachers, Will Davies, who's an amazing artist, I always asked him where you sign your painting. And he would smile and say, I always sign it over the worst part of the painting because then people are looking at the signature and they're not looking at what you've done underneath. That's pretty funny. He was a great man, a great mentor. Okay, we're getting pretty close. I'm just gonna break that up just a little more. I don't want to fuss with it. That's the, the, the dangerous thing. When you spend a little too much time, you, you sort of keep looking at it and thinking, oh, I should do this, I should do that. But if you 
continue to do that, it takes away from all the freshness of a painting. All right. I'm saying that and really tempted just to throw in a hit more of chroma. Again, near the, the barn. And I feel like I need to pick it up a little bit over here. I don't know if what I just did helped. So I'm going to actually take a little bit of that away so that it opens up. And over here, that's a little dark in there too. I don't want it to be a scary forest. Okay. Now, I'm going to go into the sky just a little bit more up in here, because this shape here, it's interesting, but I think it needs to open up just a little more right in there. Maybe there, too. And I think maybe we could just have a little peak of light coming through in a couple of spots down here. Again, at this stage, I am not following the reference. I'm just going with intuition. That's a little dark spot right there. That's just a little too much right there. Yeah, there. Just soften. If my eye is drawn too much to it, I want to take it back. Okay, I might have just lost my sound here. Sorry. So I'm going to have a low battery on my other pad here. Hang on. All right. I don't know what's going on. Maybe you can't hear me anymore. I'm having, can you hear me now? Nope. Seems to be having a technical issue. I've lost my sound. Um, oh, okay. I just had my sound kick out. So now I'm not sure what to do. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're able to hear me. I can't hear myself through my headphones. So I'm going to, you can hear. Okay, good. All right. As long as you can hear me, that's great. Um, I'm very near the end of this anyhow. Um, okay, maybe this is trying to come on again for me. I'm just going to bring this cam back again. For some reason, my connection wasn't working well. And... I'm going to bring this cam back. Okay, sounds like I'm hearing myself again. That's encouraging. Back camera. All right. Okay. 
All right, now I can hear myself again. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was just really weird. Um, I'm just going to pop that up large now. Okay, so I think I'm I'm going to call it here. What are we? Three thirty. Okay, it's an hour and a half. That's long enough for anyone to listen to anyone. Um, really hope you've enjoyed this, and uh, this was fun to do. I really, you should go and look at Bernie Fuchs' uh, paintings. They're just absolutely amazing. Um, this is a like a poor imitation of anything he would ever do, but the technique is pretty much uh, similar to what he was doing. Um, he wouldn't have as much texture in behind as what I've done here. Um, however, he would create textures uh, using sometimes, uh, uh, you know, scratching or he did a lot with Q-tips, by the way. He's the guy who shared the Q-tip idea with me. Um, and he just really created these amazing compositions, uh, lots of angles on them, lots of excitement. And um, he's, I, I just highly recommend you look at his work. You learn a lot, uh, just even on the composition side of things. Uh, he was daring. He tried a lot of different things to make them work. And um, he really is very inspirational. I'm going to throw one more tree in here just for fun. I sort of feel like I need to break it up there. And maybe darken this tree down a touch here so that it's not just one big line because it doesn't do that this one too so we have a little more sense of light and shade and maybe a couple of little wee branches up in here and i'm going to stop tickling this thing all right um uh okay so again thanks to everyone for showing up um if you enjoyed this please come back again uh subscribe that that would be great please let your friends know anyone you think might be interested in this um this is you know free for anyone to watch and uh it is being recorded at the moment as well so with uh, uh youtube and i'm not sure how long it stays on facebook maybe forever but um you can always come back and check in on it. Um, I'll post the, the link to uh, YouTube and you can always go to YouTube and look up Andrew Judd painting and um, you can uh, uh, if you want if you subscribe I think that, that just automatically kind of sends you updates somehow or other again I'm not a I don't know all the technology around this but um, we'll figure it out as we go um, as Stefan said to me um, better done than perfect. And I just love that. Jerry, thanks for showing Petra, Angelica, Sasha, thanks. And Berndt and Michelle, um, uh, really uh, thrilled that you guys have shown up. Um, I probably would have been here just talking to myself anyhow, but uh, it's really nice to have the company. I really appreciate it. And um, please stay safe, happy painting, and um, uh, we'll look forward to next Friday. Take care. Ciao.